This is the Arctic, an icy, cold, beautiful wilderness that is almost completely devoid of people, but crucial for the human race. Our energy reserves elsewhere on the planet are in the process of being depleted, but the Arctic still contains vast quantities of untapped oil and gas. The potential for conflict over these resources has resulted in a substantial increase in military activities in the Arctic during the last few years. Will we manage to resolve any future energy crises without resorting to the use of military force? For what's the engine? Finish. Modern civilization is completely dependent on oil, which, more than any other natural resources, defines our current era. The problem is that there will soon no longer be any oil left on Earth. Most of the world's large oil fields have now reached peak oil. This has resulted in oil exploration activities taking place in increasingly more remote places. There is just one source of oil that is still more or less intact. The Arctic, a sea and land massif covering 6% of the Earth's surface. Global warming and new technology are now paving the way for new transport routes and creating access to these resources. We will all be affected by the battle for these resources. For several years, there's been little military activity in the Arctic, but now all the countries in the area are starting to increase their military activity dramatically. Here, on the island of Andea, is one of the air bases that supports military operations in the Arctic. Someone who is witness to military developments in the Arctic on a daily basis is Johan Hetter, a pilot with 333 Squadron. 333 Squadron's main job is to drive overwatching and follow up in Norse interest areas, especially the North Pole. We are an instrument for the military and for the state to get information and to have a right picture of det som måtte foregå i våre interesseområder. From their base on Andøya, intelligence gathering aircraft belonging to the squadron fly to some of the most inhospitable areas in the Arctic. However, Johan Hetta is not unfamiliar with Arctic territory. Jeg vokste opp i en veldig liten samebygd hvor det bare bodde 350 mennesker midt på Tundraen på Finnmarksvidda og faren min han har hatt helt siden jeg var liten, en 16-206 på flottører. Da ble jeg bitt. Med meg så var det aldri sånn at jeg skulle bli politimann, og så skulle jeg bli brandmann, og så skulle jeg bli pilot, og så politimann igjen og noe sånt. Det har alltid vært, jeg skal alltid bli pilot da. Så det har aldri vært noe skifte sånn sett. Det er utrolig gøy å fly fremdeles, det er det jo. Og helt til å begynne med så var det jo bare det å komme seg opp var jo ufattelig morsomt. Og det slår fremdeles en dag på kontoret når som helst. The Orion aircraft is setting course for the Barents Sea in order to carry out a military mission that many people thought would be unnecessary once the Cold War had come to an end.
When the Berlin Wall fell, most people thought that the possibility of war breaking out in Europe was something that we'd put behind us. But the Cold War never really came to an end in the Arctic, where the superpowers have been playing intelligence games all along, testing out each other's first strike capabilities. This game is taking place around the polar ice cap, both above and below sea level. This area also contains vast fisheries and petroleum resources that will become even more important in the future, and these nations are using military power to enforce their rights. Arctic states are looking at a change from, from global warming. They're seeing where, according to the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, potentially a quarter of the world's oil and gas resources may be under the Arctic cap. And with that comes, as you know, appropriately, a, a great race, a great game to see who can have access to those resources first. Both throughout history and in more recent times, the Arctic has had an important military role, even in respect of conflict taking place on the other side of the world. The Svalsat satellite station is located just outside Longyearbyen on Svalbard. It's eminently suitable for downloading satellite data because the distance between the Earth's satellites and the Earth is shorter here than anywhere else in the world. On the 24th of March, 2003, when the US armed forces were heading towards Baghdad, they were stopped by a heavy sandstorm. There were two satellites circling high up in the Earth's upper atmosphere that were able to see right through the sandstorm. In order for these satellites to send their information to the Americans, they were completely dependent on being able to download their observations to a station in the Arctic. And this is where they were sent. The attack on Baghdad was able to proceed. War strategists have been totally dependent on the Arctic ever since the Second World War, because stations based in the Arctic have been able to provide forecasts about the weather in Europe 72 hours in advance. The Second World War was an entirely new type of war during which the Air Force played a crucial role. Precise weather forecasts were essential for the planning of air operations. Both the Germans and the Allies set up secret weather stations in the most inhospitable and inaccessible places they could find. One of these stations, Haudingen, was located on the northern coast of the island of Nordauslande on Svalbard. It was so inaccessible and remote that it didn't surrender to the Allies until the 4th of September, 1945. The Iron Curtain came down almost immediately after the surrender of the soldiers at Haudegen. During the course of just a couple of years, the fronts between the Western powers and Stalin's Soviet Union froze over, especially the Arctic. The Arctic really was a key area in the Cold War, and it could have become dreadfully chaotic if the war had heated up. During the Cold War, uh, the Arctic, of course, is where conflicting missiles and aircraft would have flown. And therefore, the whole northern rim of Canada uh, was lined with uh, radar stations looking for Russian aircraft. Uh, very big radars were in, in Scotland and Thule, Greenland, uh, looking for incoming. Uh, and I'm sure the Soviets had the same sort of arrangements uh, on the uh, uh, the North Shore, that if, there had, if the balloon had gone up, uh, the Arctic would have been the area over which aircraft would have flown. One of the many inventions of the Cold War was the Orion intelligence gathering aircraft, which is still involved in active service. This aircraft is equipped with top-secret listening equipment and is highly efficient at gathering information. A 
flygmaskin bara flyr genom luftrummet och tar in all den information som blir både genom radiobølger. Vi har radar ombord och andra sensorer som möjliggör att ha ett väldigt god översikt över stora områden runt oss. I tillägg till att vi idag kan fly väldigt långt och förhållsvis fort i varje fall i förhåll till en båt. På ett uppdrag så täcker vi det kystvakten vill brukt tre veckor på. One of the main tasks is to obtain as much intelligence as possible about increasing Russian activities in the area. Vi har sett en ökning i russisk militär aktivitet generellt. Da. De har varit nere på grund av dålig ekonomi och börjar att komma upp på ett normalt nivå. Det har varit unaturlig lite aktivitet de senaste tio åren. Det är er grejt att veta vad naboen gör och då därmed förebygga eventuella konflikter och att man hela tiden har öppenhet om det man driver med så att så att man förstår varandra och inte har missförståelser. This increase in military activities could cause suspicion to arise between the countries in the area. In March 2009, Norway organized a major international military exercise, Cold Response. During the Cold War, this was a common event. However, during the last 15 years, the Arctic has fallen increasingly into the shadow of the war on terror. NATO has been focusing elsewhere. For a small country like Norway, which has Russia as its closest neighbor, it's essential to get your allies to become interested in the northern areas again. The Norwegian authorities therefore invited many nations to participate in this exercise. Det vi prøver att få til nå er en økende NATO-overbygning over de øvelsene som foregår. Altså både få flere land in, få mer profil på dem, men også styrke koblingen til NATOs hovedkvarterer i Europa. Det var jo på mange måter väldigt positivt att man i løpet av tidlig 90-tall eh, nedgraderte bekymringene for konflikt i Europa. Det var jo uttryck for en väldigt optimistisk tid, eh, men utvecklingen gick nästan lite väl langt eh, i retning av att fullständigt definere bort det klassiske territoriet til fordel for operationer utenfor det klassiske territoriet. The scenario for exercise Cold Response was an imaginary conflict between two states about energy resources. After having been attacked by a larger enemy, the smaller country hits back with the help of its allies. This exercise scenario was not well received by the Russian authorities, who called the exercise a provocation. There were some reactions from Russian call på Cold Response. The Eh, tar jag egentligen med ganska stor ro. Eh, vi har en försvarsallians, vi är er inte flau över det, vi övar på försvar. Eh, men det är er alltså en eh, felläsning av det scenariet att det var ett scenario som som sådan involverade Ryssland i en resurskonflikt. Eh, detta var ett eh, et generiskt scenario som vi hade laget för att lage en en reell övningsbakgrund som var mest möjligt realistisk, men som kunde varit placerat många olika städer i världen. The Russians are reacting suspiciously to Western military activities in the Arctic. The explanation for this is largely based on past events. President Putin in 2005 said that the demise of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. I think that it's not only President Putin who thinks like this, but the society has also experienced the changes after the Cold War as a great failure. I think that the uh, steps taken by the uh, United States and NATO, other Western, Europeans, uh, Western European countries and organizations have uh, overlooked how deep 
the uh, feeling of failure and humiliation can actually be in Russia. Russia has increased its military activities in the Arctic. This illustration shows sorties undertaken by Russian military aircraft off the Norwegian coast in 2005. Two years later, these activities had increased dramatically. Their increased military activity, Russia's uh, focus on, on military power, uh, they have also a domestic dimension. The Russian public react very uh, positively to this kind of acti activities, which restore the uh, picture of Russia as a great power again. Russia's revenue from its increasing exports of petroleum and other raw materials has enabled the country to recover after the Soviet Union collapsed at the beginning of the 1990s when it lost the Cold War. Another major nation emerged victorious from this conflict. Thomas Reed was President Reagan's national security advisor at the beginning of the 1980s. The Cold War really was a conflict between two views as the role of man, government, perhaps supreme beings. Uh, it was a free uh, society believing in individual freedoms versus a society that the individual owes his allegiance to the state and exists for the existence of the state. That led to conflicts uh, and could have led to very serious conflicts with possible World War III. Uh, it did not because careful people were involved. The Cold War resulted in an unprecedented increase in military activities in the Arctic. This is the story of Camp Century, the city under ice. Here on Greenland, the USA built what was one of the Cold War's most secret projects, a launch pad for nuclear missiles beneath the ice. A maze of tunnels designed to be several hundred kilometers long and covering an area the size of Greece. As part of man's continuing efforts to master the secrets of survival in the Arctic, the United States Army has established an unprecedented nuclear-powered Arctic Research Center. Around 60 trains, each with 10 nuclear missiles ready to be launched, would travel along railway lines in the tunnels. This huge facility was to be powered by nuclear reactors which would also be placed beneath the ice. The secret base was operational between 1959 and 1966. It proved that it was possible for a large number of people to live under such extreme conditions and operate advanced military equipment. We had to show that we could operate in the Arctic, above the Arctic Circle. This forced the Soviets to keep a number of forces tied down to combat that particular threat. Uh, if we hadn't, their forces would have been free to go out into the Atlantic and raise havoc with our sea lines of communication. At the beginning of the 1980s, the Soviet Navy had modernized the vessels in its northern fleet and they'd also developed nuclear submarines that were able to hide beneath the polar ice cap. Admiral Ace Lyons decided to counter these developments with a new, aggressive American naval strategy in the Arctic. We were not going to cede control of either the North Atlantic or the Arctic uh, to the Soviets. The fact that we were able to demonstrate that we could strike the Soviet homeland from the North Atlantic, from the Arctic, 
tied down a number of their forces, and which to me was a key element in raising the level of deterrence, which is what we were really all about. We were able to do that basically without firing a shot. All stations TA, we have a possible submarine contact. A bearing 294, 3,500 yards ahead. But you're a bogey, 8015, take with missiles, uh, cover with guns. Soviet submarines were shadowed constantly from the time they left their bases on the Kola Peninsula, and they could be sunk the very minute they opened their nuclear missile launch hatches. Soviet submarine commander Boris Kolyada was a witness to the new American strategy. Это так вот шутя, а фактически это очень напряженно сказывалось на службе офицеров, на службе военно-морского флота. Jakte och det som Olion upprinnligen blev designat för och det är från deras en av huvudkvarnen våra. Forskellen ifrån det som förrik under den kalla krigen och det som vi gör nu är att för var det ju väldigt mycket mer militärt fokus än det är nu. Så vi har från deras selvfølgelig har vi militärt fokus. Vi är en militär avdelning, men vi har också väldigt mycket mer resursförvaltning och en del miljöaspekter som som är överhuvudtaget stora i uppdrag för portföljen vår för då. När det gäller fiskresurserna nåt på så blir ju de sant över hela världen och det är enorma summor det snakkar om då. Det är därför det är så attraktivt att jukse. Fish in the Arctic is a renewable resource which yields billions of dollars each year. Here in Raitan, outside Buda, is the control center which is able to see all movements in the Arctic. In practice, it's only the armed forces who are responsible for the enforcement of rights and keeping an eye on things in the Arctic. Obviously, one of the reasons for this is because they have the necessary expertise and equipment. But the use of military forces and the huge increase in military activities that's currently taking place is also an expression of the fact that there are vast assets to be guarded. Ta fiskerierna. Det är praktiskt talat ett svämmande oljefond. Det är en strategisk resurs av stor betydning för Norge men också av stor betydning för andra land. Det är svårt viktigt att ha god kontroll med fiskerierna, slik att att resursutaget är är bärkraftigt och att den ekonomin som det representerar också blir i varje tag på en skicklig måte. Det är svårt viktigt att arbeta. The Norwegian and Russian coast guards have also cooperated on the prevention of illegal fishing in the Barents Sea. In 2006, the Russian authorities asked for assistance in arresting a pirate ship, the Castor, which was fishing illegally in the Norwegian protection zone. Den förde falsk flagg. Den hade flera falska registreringsnummer om bord och vi identifierade att fartyget hade tagit och var registrerat i i vart fall tre olika stater. 
Og Castor skiftet da identitet, litt sånn avhengig av i hvilke soner og hvilke områder den opererte. Her ser vi at han tar flekker av malingen, den enda ikke tør til 6-7 timer ombord. The captain of the Castor was unwilling to allow the Coast Guard to go on board. No more discussion now. For what stop engine? Finish, finish. Det ble tatt kontroll over fartøyet, og fartøyet ble ført tilbake igjen til russisk økonomisk zone og overrakt til russiske myndigheter. Det har vært flere andre slike saker, men budskapet er egentlig at i Barentshavet så gjennomføres det en rekke operasjoner mot aktører som bedriver illegal aktivitet. Kooperasjonen mellom Norge og Russland over management av fiskeriet i Arktik har vært suksessfull for flere år nå. Men vil det være så enkelt å kooperere over en annen valuable ressurs i Arktik? En ressurs som, unlike fisk, ikke er renewabel. In 2008, two major crises occurred in Russia's neighboring territories, both of which had an impact on our view of the security situation in the Arctic. The first crisis occurred on the 8th of August 2008, when Russian tanks invaded Georgia. The second crisis, which had a direct impact on Europe, occurred later on during the same year. This time, it was the Russians exerting their power in the energy field. In connection with a conflict with Ukraine, Russia shut down the gas pipeline running via Ukraine to Europe. These pipelines were closed for several weeks. When they were eventually reopened, Western Europe's energy reserves were almost empty. Both the invasion of Georgia and the gas crisis were strong wake-up calls for the rest of the world, which had now witnessed Russia's will to exert power in its neighboring areas. I uh, have long been worried uh, uh, about uh, Europe's uh, potential dependence on, on uh, Russian natural gas, and like a lot of people, I was relatively relaxed about this from 1989 through the mid-90s because I thought, you know, buying gas from Russia might not be that different than buying it from Canada or Norway or whatever, it's just a market. But now that Putin and Medvedev are so committed to using energy as an instrument of national power in order to keep Ukraine from joining NATO, you shut off their gas, for example. Uh, that uh, situation is, I think, extremely risky. Geopolitical issues have, all, have always been important in the, in the oil industry. Uh, there are a lot of concern about the uh, security of supply from various countries where there are some political or security issues. Uh, but if we have a long-term perspective of that, we, I think we need to be optimistic. Even if there are political changes in these countries, uh, these countries will need to develop their own resources because they are so important for their developments. looking to the map of the I North, what plays Russia as in the map of the I North? How can you govern the I North without Russia? Or you confront Russia or you go on with Russia. It is important for the Alliance to develop a constructive relationship with Russia and even more important so in the Arctic, in the High North, where Russia is by far a dominant player under any respect. But gas assets are a two-edged sword for Russia. They're dependent on selling gas to Europe in order to fund their military rearmament. The Soviet Union was paradoxically in the same situation during the Cold War, and this made them vulnerable.
In June 1982, there was an explosion in a gas pipeline transporting Soviet gas from the Siberian oil fields to major customers in Western Europe. This explosion had a huge detrimental impact on the country's economy and contributed towards the collapse of the Soviet Union. The official explanation for the explosion was poor workmanship. It would take more than 20 years before the truth was revealed. An interesting episode in the Cold War was the discovery of the Soviet penetration of the US technology industries and their intent to steal that technology. Uh, it came to a head in 1981 when President Mitterrand of France uh, met with President Reagan at a summit meeting in Montreal, took him aside and said, we have acquired an agent uh, working within the Soviet technology uh, department of KGB, uh, and we have learned that they are stealing technology and targeting others, and would you be interested? To which, of course, President Reagan said yes. The Farewell Files was the code name for this agent in Moscow. It was learned what the Soviets were going to steal, and instead of stopping it, uh, the American technological industries were recruited to instead ship bogus stuff. The Soviets uh, had natural gas in Siberia. They wanted to sell it in Germany. They were building a pipeline. They needed computers to run this pipeline. Uh, they could buy the mainframe computers, but the software uh, they did not have, and they finally acquired illegally through conduits in Canada, except due to the farewell lead, we knew who that was. And so when the software was sent to the Soviets via this Canadian cutout, it had what's known as a Trojan horse. The software had been manipulated by the CIA so that it would cause the gas pipeline to explode at a given time. I believe the intent was to simply have the pipeline uh, spring a thousand leaks all over, but it appears that what really happened was the pipeline burst in the middle of Siberia, produced an explosion that was visible from space, uh, produced a lot of confusion to US intelligence analysts, and in fact, none of us, like even myself, who was in the White House at the time, learned about this until the Cold War is over and we started sorting through the historical files. Når vi ska ut på ett på ett operativt tåg så har ju det allredan varit ett stort system som har jobbat många timmar för vi kommer på jobb och vi är helt avhängig av att andra gör sin jobb för att vi ska komma oss av gårde då. Today, Johan and his crew are going to fly a long intelligence gathering mission in the Barents Sea. Radio brother, det ska vara grejt idag. Så samlas vi alla i flyget och tar en sista brief för vi tar av och vi går igen av tokte för vi lägger upp på rullbanan och kommer oss av gårde för att göra jobben. The aim of the mission is to find Russian submarines in order to map their movements and their identity. Ja, vi har ju väldigt bra översikt över marinedelen som håller till i de områden där vi opererar. Det är ju det som är jobben vår att hitta och känna igen båtar både med navn och vilken typ av båt det är och sånt. Det är det är en del av den utbildningen som du har. Jag har ju väldigt respekt för mina russiska kollegor akkurat som jag går ut ifrån att de har respekt för mig som en professionell som gör min jobb så är de också professionella i sin jobb och som sett är det ju egentligen väldigt positivt för oss att de är ute och seglar och får den träningen de ska för hvis det nog de flesta är eniga om så är det att ha ett kompetent en kompetent nabo är bättre än att ha en nabo som är dåligt tränad och 
er da du kan få ulykker og misforståelser som, som kan ske. Så at de får den träningen som de selvfølgelig skal ha, det er jo bare positivt for oss. The area patrolled by the Orion aircraft is changing rapidly. During the last 40 years, the ice around the North Pole has been melting fast. This is now making it possible to extract large quantities of oil and gas. Petroleum reserves elsewhere in the world are being exhausted, so pressure on the Arctic is increasing. People must keep in mind that producing oil and natural gas in those regions is extremely difficult. Conditions are terribly harsh. Uh, in some cases, they're almost impossible. Uh, in cases where it's almost impossible, the cost of producing uh, oil or natural gas escalate dramatically. So yes, there is a prize there to be, I hope, uh, gained by a number of countries that have borders uh, around uh, that region, but it won't be simple and it will not be fast and it is likely to be political me politically messy also. The military race in the Arctic has started. And once more, soldiers from other NATO countries are taking part in exercises in the Norwegian snow. I think you're seeing an increased operational tempo uh, of NATO's interest because we see an evolving policy towards the high north. Um, Russians have certainly expressed their strong interest as well as our Canadian colleagues. They are now uh, providing troops, uh, contingents in both to look at Arctic operations, search and rescue. So again, I think you're looking not just from the U.S. perspective, but NATO and many of our closest allies are, are taking a strong posture in the high north. The melting ice is not just resulting in better access to oil and gas. It can also create new and more efficient transport routes. In the future, it may be possible to transport goods along the Canadian coast through the Northwest Passage and along the coast of Northern Russia through the Northeast Passage. By using these new routes, the transport time from Asia to Europe could be reduced by almost 40%. But these new transport routes are also causing conflict. They are one of the reasons why Canada, for example, is now increasing its military activities in the Arctic. The need to assert our sovereignty and to take action to protect our territorial integrity in the Arctic has never been more urgent. Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper is ready and clear on the subject. You either use it or you lose it. Let me be absolutely clear that your new national government is committed to using it. Canada is staking its claim to the Northwest Passage as being in Canadian territorial waters. But the USA doesn't agree with its neighbor and thinks that the Northwest Passage is in international waters with unrestricted transport for everyone. The question of the status of the Northwest Passage is, a, is an area where we agree to disagree. But at some point, there will have to be some clarification and clarity brought to our, our disagreement on uh, the status of the Northwest Passage. On the other side of the North Pole, the melting ice is presenting Russia with a security challenge as its entire northern coastal strip is becoming exposed. The Russian Northern Fleet is now undergoing substantial modernization. One of Russia's military commitments involves the modernization of its nuclear submarines, which are able to fire their missiles from concealed positions beneath the surface of the ocean. This is exactly the type of Russian submarine that Johan and his Orion aircraft crew are hunting for today. Oh, 
och hålla öje med var ubåtar är det blir ganska viktigt när man tänker på att de största ubåtarna har över 200 stridshoder som är ganska många gånger större än i Hiroshima bomben så i praxis så kan en ubåt ta, ta ut ja, 200 byr då. Det är inte något problem. After several hours in the air, the Orion aircraft has still not managed to detect any Russian submarines. Suddenly, the Orion sensors register something beneath the surface of the sea. The crew shoot out listening boys to find out what it might be. After a while, it becomes apparent that the aircraft is flying above a Russian Delta-class submarine. It's over 150 meters long and is equipped with long-range missiles. The submarine remains hidden beneath the Barents Sea, but the crew of the Orion have secured important intelligence data and they return to base. History has shown that military activities in the Arctic are a dangerous balancing act. Norway, Canada and Russia are now increasing their military focus in the area. Does this mean that the Cold War is back? Den viktiga skillnaden på hur hur man tänkte militärt om Arktis under den kalla krigen och nu är er att under den kalla krigen så var ju poängen rent militärt. Det var rent fysiskt så är er Arktis den kortaste vägen mellan Gavern Sovjetunionen och USA. När man har ett militärt blick på norrområden idag är er det ju inte disse grunderna men men det är er mer avledet av att det är er en en civil kommersiell intresse för norrområdena alltså resurserna fisken transportrutorna så att det är er, det är er helheten av det som skapar ett önske i alla staterna om att följa med på det som sker bättre efterrättning mer evne till närvär både fredstidsnärvär med alltså kustvakt tjänster sök och räddning övervakning men också evne till att eh, göra sin intresse tydliga i där som man skulle få en mer komplicerad situation I hope we can avoid wars. Uh, it's not inconceivable that there will be wars. The Arctic has potential, uh, probably significant potential to produce natural gas and uh, useful and significant quantities of oil also. Uh, I think we're all well aware of the fact that um, the areas up there are disputed between countries, and uh, we're going to have to find some way to settle those uh, those land disputes. Um, and I hope that's peaceful, by the way, because uh, there have been resource wars in the past, and uh, I would hope that we can avoid those uh, at, uh, at our stage of uh, development and civilization uh, today. Nordområdene, sånn som vi känner det i dag, er et stabilt område som innehåller mange strategiske verdier. Det är er i väldigt stor forskjell til andre områder i verden hvor man finner strategiske verdier og resurser. Disse er väldigt ofte karakterisert med, med uro, ustabilitet og militær konflikt. Den situation har vi ikke i nordområdene. Därför är er det maktbeliggande för oss att uppträ på en sån måte att vi inte får en slik ustabil situation i norr. In order to show that priority is being placed on the northern areas, the Norwegian armed forces are now transferring their operational leadership from southern Norway to northern Norway. 
They're also organizing international military exercises close to the Russian border. Russia has great sensitivity to any NATO exercise along its border. We are in a very hypersensitive time where NATO is uh, exercising near uh, the perceived uh, sphere of influence uh, of, of Russia. It's absolutely understandable, and I think uh, uh, NATO asked Moscow to be an observer to the High North uh, um, exercises, not a participant, but an observer, and, and, and Moscow flatly rejected that uh, that offer and then in kind held uh, exercises uh, uh, very close to uh, to to Finland I think you'll see this tit for tat I think it's again each other's they're, they're showing each other their interest they're showing each other their response to uh, to an evolving uh, policy but again what's so critical is to maintain dialogue There is a range of steps we may take to avoid at least fueling of the suspicious attitudes uh, prevailing on the Russian side. So the military activity, which is of, highest, uh, of the highest concern uh, to Russia, should be definitely transparent, include Russia to the possible extent, of course, and avoid appearing uh, as provocative. NATO's military leaders are also keen to resolve the race for resources in the Arctic without resorting to military force. We don't want to return to the Cold World atmosphere. We want to prevent this to happen. So if we want to prevent this to happen, the, f the best and more useful strategy is to engage in a relationship with Russia to make Russia a responsible co-player of the international community. NATO need to be careful not to be an element of rising tension on the country, an element of keeping the low tension and even building greater stability. In order to maintain stability in the Arctic, the nations are continuing to boost their military activities. This is why there has been an increase in the work of those who have been appointed to keep an eye on resources. We have more and more to do, so I think that our work is going to be more and more in the future. The Arctic Council has been in the Militär aktivitet nöke och fiskeri resursen försvinner ju förstås på det visar inte. Altså, hvis vi i allt fall inte vis vi passar på, så uppgåvan um, blir större hela tiden det och kommer inte att försvinna. Inte minst min karriär pågår i allt fall det är helt säkert.